An estranged husband, enraged by his wife doing better than him financially and his family not inviting him to a Christmas Eve party, decided to do the unthinkable on Christmas Day. Aziz Yazdanpana was a 56-year-old Iranian-born father of two living in the United States with his family, more specifically in Colleyville, Texas, near the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. He was lovingly referred to by his neighbors as Bob, for some reason, and was said to be seen mostly out working in his yard, seeming carefree with no signs of conflict. In 2008, he had been unemployed for over a decade. He had previously been working in the mortgage business, but for some unknown reason he had quit and refused to ever go back to working in his field. This really hit him in the pride and became a sore spot for him, a real hot button issue. It didn't help that his wife, Fatima Ramadi, was working and his wife's brother, Ali Ramadi, had been financially supporting the family for years. Initially, Fatima utilized her cosmetology license and had two jobs at two different spas. But in the end, she was running a beauty salon in the nearby city of Plano. Formerly, Aziz had forbidden his wife from working, but after he stopped working himself, he relented and decided it would be better that she work than that nobody work. But she did still struggle to support the family on her own without Aziz working alongside her. They went into financial troubles only a few years after he stopped working. But even before, Aziz hadn't really been the best with finances himself. Federal court records show that he was actually placed on three years of probation back in 1996 after it was discovered that he was caught falsifying a federal income tax return. He ended up having to pay a $1,000 fine and $30,119 in restitutions. Then, three years later, he and his wife filed for bankruptcy. Fatima had hoped that the proceedings would keep the banks from foreclosing on their home for, if nothing, a little bit longer, but the case was discharged within a few months after they failed to make planned payments. Throughout this time, Aziz wasn't exactly being a model father. According to friends, he would often lie about trips that he took to his wife, uh, saying that he was going on business trips or something, but actually going to a hotel and sleeping with prostitutes. Can I say prostitutes? I mean, I got away with it in the K-pop video, but... Uh, eventually, one of these friends would go on to tell Ramadi about these escapades, obviously leading to tensions in the marriage. Ultimately, one year later in 2011, Aziz's wife, Fatima, decided to move out of their family home in April and take the family's two children with her. They moved into an apartment complex only two miles away, but even this much distance was enough to drive Aziz wild. Not only did he have the shame and guilt of being unemployed while his wife and his brother-in-law covered the finances, but he now had his kids taken away from him as well. Fatima was generally a private person who nearly really ever spoke out about her personal life with her co-workers, but it was clear even to them that she was overworked, stressing out, and struggling to support her family. A co-worker told police that she did have several conversations with her, in which she stated her complaints that Aziz was neither providing for his family nor living up to his Muslim responsibility. Ramadi was concerned that Aziz was not taking the income divorce proceedings very well at all. She had voiced this concern to both some of her colleagues and to her apartment management. At least one of Aziz's neighbors referred to him, instead of just Bob, as Packing Heat Bob. It seems that once in the past, Aziz had told his neighbor that he was carrying a gun because he was having problems with the boys trying to date his daughter. The neighbor was seemingly unsure if he was actually serious, mistakenly taking the matter as a joke. Aziz's daughter, Nona, had recently graduated from Colleyville Heritage High School and was starting to attend a local community college. She had hoped to go on to a school in California and become a lawyer. Her friend had indicated that she had recently hinted that things in her life were becoming increasingly difficult, but she didn't give many details. Her father had become extremely strict with her, likely over fears that she may begin dating someday, and she came to see her mother as the more rational and understanding parent. People saw Aziz as a bum and maybe even a little bit of an asshole, but nobody really assumed that he would get violent. On Christmas Eve, the Yazdanpa family was throwing a huge party at their ranch. 
A whole slew of family and friends came and went out to the house throughout the evening, dragging long into the night. Aziz hated his wife's sister with a passion. He felt that she did nothing but serve as an obstacle in his marriage, and felt that she was often trying to drive a wedge between he and his wife. He felt that she had control over the kids as well, and was fully convinced that she was telling the kids that he was evil, and that they were listening. She had helped Ramadi move into her new apartment, and even helped her buy some necessities like uh, furniture, consumables, and Aziz likely saw this as something that reaffirmed his previous beliefs. He was deeply insulted when his wife and the rest of the family didn't invite him out to the Christmas party. He was even more angry when he learned that his sister-in-law was in attendance. He seethed in anger all throughout the night and into the next morning. The next morning, Christmas morning, Fatima, the kids, and some other family members were at the apartment she was staying at in Grapevine. Aziz decided to show up, unexpectedly and unannounced, also uninvited, dressed as Santa Claus. The family begrudgingly let him in. Many of them did not do much to hide their disgust. His niece, Sarah, sent a text message to her friend shortly after Aziz arrived. So, we're here. We just got here and my uncle is here too. Dressed as Santa. Awesome. Her sarcasm was a secret to nobody. Aziz was clearly unwelcome at the home, but nobody wanted to be the one to kick him out. About 15 minutes later, she again texted, now he wants to be all fatherly and win father of the year because he fucked up before. This would be the last time that anybody would hear from her. The whole family opened presents and talked for a while, with Aziz awkwardly trying to act like the best father he could imagine. To his dismay, nobody was about to be fooled. Perhaps this was all some wicked test that Aziz had planned out to see if his wife and kids would respect him if he showed up. Or maybe he had already decided on his next move and he was merely biding his time and waiting for an opportunity. When the family finished opening up presents and started cleaning up the wrapping paper, Aziz revealed two handguns. It is unknown exactly how and in what order the following events played out, but this is what is known. Aziz aimed his guns and shot his wife, Fatima, once in the head. He shot his 14-year-old son, Ali, and 19-year-old daughter, Nona, each multiple times in the head. He shot both his sister-in-law and her husband, and went as far as killing their daughter, the niece that had sent the text messages, as well. At 11.34 a.m., Aziz then called 911 himself. During this call, the dispatcher was unable to hear him clearly. Hearing nothing but gasping breaths, the operator asked if he needs any help or if he was sick but the responses were incomprehensible. Officers, believing nobody was on the other end of the call, decided to go ahead and head over to the location. Trying one more time, the operator asked if he needed an ambulance or police. Let's listen to the call and see if you can make out what he's trying to say here. Grapevine 911, where is your emergency? Hello, Grapevine 911. You need help? Are you sick? What was that? Do you need an ambulance or police? Hello? One moment. I was getting heavy breathing on the phone and I need to turn the clock so please send it the original audio was almost impossible to make out, and it wasn't able to be understood until the dispatchers used software to amplify his voice. Even then, it took them several playbacks until they understood. Aziz had whispered, I'm shooting people, into the phone. In the background, it's believed that someone was screaming, help, help. After making the 911 call, Aziz gave up the fight. He tried to stage a scene by placing one of the two guns into the hand of his dead brother-in-law trying to make it look as if he committed the crime. But he took the other gun, turned it on himself, and took his own life before the police arrived. Police arrived just three minutes later and forced themselves into the home via kicking down the door. They entered the middle-class suburban apartment in hopes of finding out that this was all a misunderstanding. Sadly, that was not the case, and they were too late. They found that nobody in the home was still alive. They retreated to a horrific scene that Christmas day, Seven bodies were sprawled out among the freshly opened presents and shredded wrapping paper. Some of the victims were still in their pajamas. A TV was still playing in the living room. 
Everyone had been shot at least once in the head, including Aziz himself, with several covered in bullet holes over the rest of their bodies as well. In this area, many of the nearby apartments were actually vacant, leaving no adjacent neighbors to report any odd sounds. The nearest people who lived nearby had actually described the day as quiet. The victims ranged in age from 14 to 59, spanned several generations, and consisted of two families. Two entire nuclear families had been wiped out in the span of a few minutes. Uh, the police were not thrown off by the scene that Aziz had staged. It was pretty blatantly obvious that the brother-in-law had not fired a gun and that Aziz had been the only one to fire off both of the handguns found in the house. With the completion of an initial brief examination, it was my opinion that the victims had been systematically executed, said one investigator. All of the evidence would lead one to believe that Yazdan Pana had been the lone shooter during the incident, wrote another. Neighbors were shocked to look outside and see the investigation happening from their windows. There hasn't been any crime in this complex that they know of, not even a break-in, said nearby resident Vanessa Barrera. To hear something like this, it's shocking. Police, not knowing the family history, struggled to find a motive. I think he was probably overwhelmed when it was all said and done and decided to take his life instead, said Police Sergeant Robert Eberling. We really don't have any clear idea of why he did this. Sometimes there's not really a good explanation for irrational behavior. A private burial was held for the family the next Thursday, during which a family friend stated that she had felt that Aziz had become upset because his wife was doing well on her own. However, despite knowing of these marital issues, friends of the family never even began to imagine something like this would ever happen. The mayor of the city, William Tate, even spoke out that Sunday night in a statement saying, This is obviously a terrible tragedy. The fact that it happened on Christmas makes it even more tragic. A candlelight memorial service was held in Parr Park in Grapevine later in the year to honor the victims of the massacre. The city is normally a very quiet area, with the last homicide having occurred more than a whole year prior. One of the neighbors in the apartment complex stated that he had moved to the area with his family six months prior and had always felt safe, but now he's afraid to even let his 10-year-old son play outside on his own. Coming back from visiting family for the holiday and seeing police cars surrounding the home was a life-changing experience. We may never really know what exact plan Aziz had for that day. Was he planning to kill his family regardless of what happened? Or was he mainly just going to kill them off if they didn't treat him kindly enough? Sadly, there's no way to know, as anyone who could enlighten us on the details is long gone today. Once again, thank you for watching, I really appreciate it. Uh, if you don't mind, dropping a like helps with the algorithm, and if you like content like this, feel free to subscribe, because that's what I do here. If you really want to support the channel even further, I do have a Patreon account, which I have linked in the description below. Speaking of which, shout out to my top patrons. Jules Latona, Arctic Cat, Alan Damiani, Adrian Lawley, Matthew Damateo, Murray Joel Sanchez, David McLaughlin, Marsh, Buffazerk, Lonroll, Jewel Movchan, Lori Tayaba, Kim Peek, Lux Alpaca, Charity, Skooky Main, Foxlicity, Jackie, Lavenderwise, and Trace Ferguson. As I always tend to say, you guys are the best. Thank you, and good night.